Right. So it's a huge, huge, huge pleasure to welcome everyone at our in-person TVA meeting. So we are back, you know, where we were four years ago. Uh, so as you know, we were supposed to run this meeting two years ago, but yeah, I didn't have to do the COVID. But here we are, and actually we are from the plus uh, delegates, which is great. So we have more than 50 talks and more than 30 posters. Now I uh, have a couple of calls announcements to make the first of all, uh, our breakfast will be not where we had dinner, but breakfast will be in a main restaurant. Okay, and you'll find it. It's kind of... No, yeah. <laughs> I know you'll find it. Uh, our dinner tomorrow will be the same place where it was today. So, exactly the same place. And on Wednesday, whether nothing, we might have barbecue outside. Uh, so, other than that, yes, yeah, for talks. So, have you got Andrew there, who is, uh, you know, doing all the AV job for us? Thanks, Andrew. And uh, for speakers, uh, we ask that everyone goes and speak to Andrew before their talk. And Andrew will let you up. So, you can either bring your talk, talk on the memory stick. And we will load it, and we will load it into our computer. Or you can actually plug in your computer. But please do and talk to Andrew probably from 15 minutes before two correct? And you will also get uh, all the slides with the microphone. All right? Now, those of you who are presenting posters, so first of all, will be delivered tomorrow between 8 and 9 in the morning. That means that uh, you may not be able to put up your poster before talk, but you know, if you bring it along, you can, you should be able to put it up in the first, during the first coffee break. All right. Anything else? So, anyway, I'm really glad we are where we are. And lots of thanks to Dorothy. Dorothy, where are you? Oh, Dorothy! And, uh, and actually, uh, also to Oliver. Oliver, where you are? Oli. Oli? Anyway, let's thank Oli as well. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I guess what am I saying, Oli? Oh, yeah, we, we have like a stand corner there uh, where so some of the posters will be put in the auto here behind where you're sitting. And it's next to where Andrew is with equipment. But some of the poster boards will be also in the small kind of chapel area. Uh, and uh, this way actually leads to toilets. There are uh, toilets at the end at the exit into the car park. Uh, so, post uh, some post boards will be in that area. And we have like a front corner where you can make your own exit or virus. Right? So, we have some giant balloons and, and some pins there. So, you know, please have fun. Uh, if you will. Uh, what else? That's probably about it. Yeah, so any questions, let us know. So, you know, Dorothy, you know, Oliver, uh, and uh, there is actually a team of us from York, and of course, Cecil. So, Cecil was helping us, you know, um, oh, remotely, yeah, from France. Anyway, uh, very warm welcome, and I'll let Cecil go. Take it over. Thank you very much, Fred. Well, it's indeed a um, great pleasure to welcome you here. Um, in Manchester, in England. Um, without further ado, I think uh, um, some of you are quite tired, so we uh, let us start the day. Uh, it's extremely elegant today, I must say. Thank you. Okay, address the elephant in the room. I'm wearing a tie. And as I've told people who have asked about it, the next time you see me in one, I'll be lying in a box. Uh, but there's a reason, there's a rationale. Uh, this is my family tartan. This is the Jardine family tartan. And about you know, 200 kilometers north of here is uh, the family residence, Bedroom's Tower, which was abandoned for a number of years because it was haunted by uh, a miller who perished in the dungeons while the Lord went to town and forgot about him. Uh, but it's been turned into a high end uh, bed and breakfast and spa. Whatever. Uh, and my family crest and more uh, Also, I'm wearing a tie out of uh, 
deep appreciation uh, of, of this community. I've been coming to these meetings since 1991. Uh, very much a family. I've had met and worked with fantastic colleagues here, and even more than that, I made uh, lifelong friends and, and hope those of you who are here for the first time share that same experience if you continue to come back to this meeting. So, let's jump in with a quick outline. Uh, I'll be introducing the idea of phases and model systems, which should be familiar to most of you. I'm going to talk about double stranded DNA packaging, the area of interest that I've focused on for the last 25 years. I'll talk about our early structural efforts, followed by a summary of some early laser treatment experiments, single molecule experiments. I'll discuss uh, a period of crisis and, and complexity in the 529 DNA packaging system. I'll talk about the structural advances that have been made and simulation. And our current model, we have a new mechanism that uh, we first reported several years ago in press. It is a good mechanism, but it's not good enough. There are still some issues with it. And I'll uh, end my talk uh, talking about some of the possibilities of, of what sort of refinements that we might be seeing in this mechanism in the near future. So it could come as no surprise, that is the most sensitive remote in the world. Uh, it's the most surprise that pages have been model systems for basic biological processes uh, for many generations. So we have here some of the key uh, metabolic functions within all living systems, first being, uh, being described and much of the mechanism determined using phages as, as models, just simply because they're accessible, they're tractable models, uh, they're fun. Uh, you could do an experiment in a day instead of two weeks if you're in, in a eukaryotic system. Uh, and by extension, also phage adjunct systems like the CRISPR-Cas system and now the whole battery of anti-phage systems as well as the anti-anti-phage systems has expanded so the range and scope through which studying phage has, has led to the discovery of many basic principles and processes in molecular biology. Uh, those of you who have been listening to me talk for any length of time know that I, I really like this model, which is uh, one presented by Bruce Alberts in Yakulai uh, in 1992, which they refer to as the path to enlightenment for understanding cellular biology, in which you have to have a complete inventory of all your components, a description of all the reaction intermediates that those components are arranged in during whatever process it is that you're studying. You need to know basically kinetic information with the detailed rates of all transitions that must occur for, for function. And you need uh, atomic resolution structure if you really want to get down to the real details of these systems and understand what's happening at the truly molecular level. And over the last 25 years, we've really tried to use 529 and projected it onto this model and pursued all of these various aspects in one form or another in an effort to understand its biology and particular uh, DNA packaging. So, 529. 529 was first isolated from the soil uh, in St. Paul, Minnesota. I live two kilometers from its point of origin uh, by uh, Bernard Riley, who came over to Dwight Anderson in uh, the Minneapolis campus of uh, University of Minnesota. Dwight had the first electron microscope. They looked at 60 phage isolates that Riley had, had looked at, and number 29 was appealing because it was small. It had a relatively small prolate icosahedral head, small being small genome, and in 1965, let's just say molecular genetics weren't, wasn't like it is today, uh, so they thought it might be actually an, an accessible system uh, for study. The prolate head indicates some form determination function in assembly. The tail indicates tail assembly, as well as the processes which these, all of these components engage in the infection and delivery of the dead double-stranded 19 total base genome inside the cell into the host of the cell itself. Wow. <laughs> well, why not? So, uh, so just a brief, uh, brief summary, uh, and as most of you know, in, in virus assembly, and we'll see this repeated uh, at some point, hopefully I'll do a competent enough job that no one has to correct me, uh, but we have the assembly of a prohead which is going to be our empty receptacle into which we're going to deliver the DNA genome prior to tail attachment down here at the bottom, yielding mature uh, variants that will exit the cell, find new cells, absorb onto their surface, and deliver the genome into them and start this process all over again. The DNA pr uh, packaging process has been one that's been exceptionally, we've been exceptionally lucky. Uh, I'd say we're good, but most of it's probably luck. And uh, of these 60 pages, the 29th one, happens to support an exceptionally uh, accessible and high efficiency in vitro DNA packaging system. 
So as we focus on DNA packaging, there are multiple events. Uh, we have an initiation complex that's going to form with the components of the, port, the, the decameric portal or connector that's embedded in the head shell. We're going to attach a motor to that. It's going to grab DNA, drive it into the, into the head to near crystalline density. And after packaging is completed, these motor components, with the exception of the portal here in yellow, detached and are replaced by the, by the assembly tail components. So we typically think of the whole particle as the DNA packaging machine, uh, not just one individual component. And at least in the most stripped down version, we would think about the portal itself, which interacts and binds with a relatively unique component called prohead RNA, which is a structural RNA of no information bearing function that acts as a scaffold upon which is anchored a pentameric ring and TPAs, uh, GP16 and 529, which is probably analogous to the uh, large terminase complexes that you see in most of the other uh, tail phage systems, ones that require uh, large and small terminase complexes. We're able to get away without it because we actually have a covalent link terminal protein like adenovirus on ours, and it's likely the interaction of that terminal protein with the ATPase uh, motor complex that starts initiation and then begins translocation. So the in vitro system is almost miraculous, and every time, I don't get into the lab often, but every time I do, and if I'm doing a packaging reaction, I'm still amazed at how great, good this system works. So using purified components, we can add all of these things together, throw in ATP, come in and then treat those samples with, uh, with DNAs, and what we see is that compared to the input, all of the DNA is protected, having the package been safely and nestled inside the capsid, and a negative control here without ATP showing, of course, that it's an ATP dependent process. We take an interdisciplinary approach because we're hitting these very different uh, packets of, of, of types of information that we're trying to describe about the system. Uh, University of Minnesota anchors the biology of the system where we do both genetics and uh, biochemistry as well as produce most of the material components for other studies in structural biology of single molecule. Uh, structural biology, uh, it's mainly housed now at uh, Indiana University with Mark Murray, but over the past we've had collaborators from Cornell, UCSD, Tim Baker, Alan at Cornell, Michael Rossman uh, at uh, Purdue, and uh, Hiroshi Matsuo, who was an MLR guy who did some work for us at uh, University of Minnesota. Complementing this are two single molecule biophysics groups, uh, Carlos Bustamante's group at UC Berkeley and Doug Smith's group at the University of California, San Diego. And we've recently onboarded a new uh, technology with computational modeling with a uh, guard Aria at the uh, Duke University, who had a graduate student uh, who, whose work I'll mention. Uh, I'll focus on actually through, through much of this presentation. So the structural efforts have been going on for a very long time. Uh, these are sections, crystals of 529 crowheads that were grown in 1985. Uh, the trick was. Uh, they weren't growing in your normal hanging drop diffusion vapor or whatever method, uh, but they simply form spontaneously in, on the inside of dialysis tubing during purifications of high, high concentration preparation. Uh, unfortunately, at some point on the road to getting these into a beam line, the manufacturer changed the formulation of the dialysis tubing that was being used at the University of Minnesota, and we were never able to reproduce these crystals ever again. Uh, Jack Johnson actually took some of these crystals uh, back to Purdue with him and then later apologized to Dwight Anderson, who was the, running the lab at the time, because he didn't get to them soon enough and they had turned into, as Jack said, tiny mud balls. So we never ever did get to crack one of these. So, uh, in 1997, I joined uh, Dwight's group at the University of Minnesota. I had hair. Uh, and stayed ever since. Dwight retired from 15 years ago, and I was uh, lucky enough to inherit the 529 system. Uh, I also include this picture because it includes someone who visited while I was a postdoc, uh, Dr. Edward Kellenberger, who some of you may be familiar with from the literature or even personally, who's really uh, been an inspiration in terms of the quality and the, and the uh, just the rigor with which we approach science, and I think gauges certainly make that uh, even, even more accessible to those of us who do model. And of course, Charlene was my lab mom when I was a postdoc, and she still is hopefully thinking of me at some point. So after I joined, there were some very quick early structural successes. Uh, one of the first being the solution of the uh, of the connector comp of the connector structure, 
which again is the decameric portal structure, forms a ring at the packaging vertex of double stranded DNA viruses. Typically, it's referred to as a portal in some systems. In T4 and 529, uh, historically, it's been called connectors. Uh, this was solved by Alan Simpson and Michael Rossman's group and was the first atomic structure of, of any of the components of the 529 DNA packaging system that was identified. Buried in the, in the paper uh, that this was published in was this article. Uh, this is the first imaging of a, an actual intact DNA packaging complex on a double stranded DNA virus particle. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be the actual first person to actually see this thing. It's stable enough and large enough you can see it in negative state EEM. You know? Uh, but then it was, uh, we did cryo reconstruction with Issa Tao in uh, Rossman's lab and ended up with this projection of what is uh, a packaging motor sitting doing its thing. This is back in the blobology days when 24 angstroms sounded high resolution. Uh, but it was, in fact, our first look at this thing. And in comparing different maps with and without RNA, we could see what the RNA component is. So the rest of this little blob down here is our ATPase. That's our packaging ATPase. It was at that point that we realized that this ring ATPase was part of a much larger uh, uh, ecology of ring ATPases that perform vital functions in all living systems. Uh, the stoichiometry can vary, uh, pentamers, hexamers, some sevenmers. And they're all somewhat interrelated, sharing common traits, including a Walker A and Walker B ATV binding site and high catalytic site, and many of them performing translocation functions, uh, moving DNA from one side of a cell to another, uh, denaturing proteins in the proteasome. All of these things we like to grab on the polymers, hydrolyze NTPs, typically ATP, and drive them through this ring structure in order to achieve some metabolic function within a cell. And of course, in 529, that function is to drive DNA into the capsid to make a mature virion to go out and kill some more at the cell study. So, when I talk about big questions, the first, one of the introductory slides, it was you know, some of the big questions that seem to fall out of basic science in cage biology. And although I would never be so bold as to claim that I'm going to be the one to originate all of the mechanics and mechanisms of this incredibly diverse and broad class of molecular motors. We have been a little ahead of everybody else over the last 15 years or so. And I do hope, in fact, that at least some of the things that we're learning about the 529 system enlighten other investigators in other systems, particularly eukaryotic systems, and therefore, once again, allow phage to play a, a, a big role, even though it's a little phage, in uh, molecular biology, biophysics, and biochemistry. Around the time I also joined uh, Dwight Anderson's lab, Sally Grimes, my uh, research partner for many years, uh, was taking trips to Oregon to visit a uh, crazy single molecule guy named Carlos Bustamante, and they had this weird idea that they could actually see DNA packaging using a, method a methodology that uh, Bustamante was uh, uh, heavily involved in developing called laser teasers. In a general laser teaser experiment, and I'll jump right to the 529 experiment, in the initial experiment, we would have two uh, polystyrene microspheres. One would be coated with antibodies raised against the capsid protein, and therefore would be able to bind, stably bind empty capsids. And the other, uh, streptavidin tag, which could buy, bind a biotinylated free end of DNA that was floating around on the outside. And if you roll ATP into this, and this thing is initiated DNA packaging, this motor is actually going to pull this bead towards this pipetomobilized bead. And you can do two experiments in this mode. You can hold it in constant position here on the right, and by measuring the deflection from the center of the beam, you can actually measure the force generating capacity of the motors. 529 is about a 75 picanewton motor, which, compared to my estimate of 12, uh, makes it one of the stronger molecular motors so far described. But one of the most valuable ones is running in this constant feedback mode where you just put a little bit of tension on the DNA tether and allow the beads to come together, allow the motor to pull the beads together in order for you to measure the velocity of the DNA packaging. Uh, these are the first two traces of DNA translocation in 529. Uh, I'd love to say I was in the room when it happened at Berkeley. Steve Smith, a longtime uh, lab manager and inventor of various instruments, uh, collected the experiment. Kelly and Dwight were in the room. I was downstairs having a cigarette and missed it. Uh, but as you can see, on one side, on the y-axis, we have the extension, basically the measurement of the, the relative position of the beads one to another. And then over time, here we're just sort of jiggling the thing around, moving it closer, 
But it's cer- at a certain point, it starts moving on its own. The beads are start, start to be drawn together on their own, and that is, in fact, a single DNA packaging motor, really those two beads together. And it's still somewhat chilling to think that while you're watching this, the beads are actually watching the function of a single macromolecular complex. It's really quite astonishing. Uh, the immediate application of this, uh, and the first work was done by Sondra Tons and uh, Doug Smith in, in Bustamante's lab. One of the early observations that was, was probably one of the more dramatic and interesting things was the DNA packaging slowed down over time. So with the amount of DNA package, the motor encounters more and more resistance as the DNA is pressurized inside the capsule. DNA at this scale is relatively stiff. When you bend it to get it in the capsule, it takes energy. It's highly repulsive. It's each uh, ph- uh, phosphate backbones with repelling each other. And so under confinement, we saw that the motor actually started to decrease in velocity. There were some errors in the early assumptions that we made in interpreting this data, uh, particularly one that was this was a constant power motor. It always generated uh, power regardless of filling volume, and that therefore the decrease in velocity that we would measure over the range of packaging was directly due to resistive force. But as we get to the end of my presentation today, you'll see that it's a little more complex than that. But the, one of the greatest things about this system is we can measure the rate of DNA packaging. And those of you who didn't fail first year biochemistry the way I did, you might remember that kinetics is a wonderful way to study the mechanism of, of a lot of complicated objects. And we can measure the velocity of DNA packaging in this example, going from high to low in TP concentration. So you can do michaelis Menten kinetics using laser tweezers because the, cat- the, the catalytic product of DNA packaging at ATP hydrolysis is DNA movement. It's not a chemical product. It's actually a force generation translocation of an object. Uh, this was work done by uh, Jan Schemmer. Uh, and then I'm going to go through really quickly to get us up to the current state of affairs. Uh, Jan and, and Jeff Moffat in, in uh, Bustamante's lab thought, well, let's take it up one notch and see what kind of resolution we can actually get. And they undertook this insane task of trying to build an optical instrument that could measure angstrom resolution translocation of DNA inside the motor, which is just still all completely baffling, and I can't say I understand all the physics behind the design of the machine, although it is immaculate and beautiful. Uh, part of the strategy to give us this high resolution is to move to a dual trap system from both both uh, beads, both our prohead binding bead here at the top and our free and DNA bead are, are suspended in laser tweezers track. And that, that allows you to separate harmonic noise that might be happening within the system. It also decouples the whole system from any physical object inside the, the, uh, the, the buffer filled chamber that we're working on. But our pet is actually a physical thing connected to the bench. Nothing here is connected to anything, and they're just floating in solution, suspended by the laser tweezer. Uh, it worked. Um, they got incredibly high resolution data out of their first try, and we were astonished to find that there was already a lot of complexity in this DNA translocation reaction, much more so than we thought, in that it seemed that the motor actually existed in two different states during DNA translocation. One is a state in which there's no mechanical movement and no translocation of DNA, which we call the dwell state. And then there's a force generating step that we call the burst phase, which then resets the motor, and you go back into adult dwell phase, so we have this alternating dwell burst period just to be cycling uh, within the motor. Uh, we were really excited at first. Uh, from biochemistry, some early biochemistry in Anderson's lab uh, by Tushman Guo, as well as some repeated experiments that Shelley and I had done uh, we had a pretty good estimate of how much DNA you translocated per ATP molecule, and it was around two base pairs per ATP. It's a pentameric motor, binds five ATPs, and if you're packaging two base pairs each, you're translocating ten base pairs, looking at the, at the catalytic hydrolysis of, eight, of all five ATPs in the motor, with a really rapid translocation of ten base pairs. And then you go through this reset period where the motor's going to get rid of the ADP that's left over, rebind ATP, and then get started again for the whole process. And then things got a little crazy. Uh, a higher resolution experiment, and these were uh, the work of both, both Gemma, but mostly Jeff Moffat, who did most of the engineering construction of the instrument, showed that it wasn't 
and it's back up really quick. Five sub-steps of five ATP hydrolysis events from our pentameric motor that it was in fact four sub-steps of 2.5 base pairs DNA translocated per step step, which completely blew everybody away. Well, actually, it was a total crisis. I almost had a nervous breakdown. I thought the universe is alive and nothing is ever going to work again in the lab. Uh, but it is true. Uh, so here, again, looking at changes in contour length over time at a very short time scale, in the millisecond mill 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 time scale. These hash marks are uh, about 2.5 base pairs apart. And you can see these little steps through the noise. But if you do a statistical analysis on the relative distance between these sub steps, you actually find that each 10 base pair burst is divided into four 2.5 base pair sub steps. But we package two base pairs for ATP. Right? It was, and 2.5 is a non integer number. It's like climbing a ladder but skipping every other rung. Like, how the hell does the motor actually accommodate this sort of? This this weird interaction between this ATPase and its polymer substrate. So we continue to build a mechanochemical model based on these early observations. Uh, we knew, uh, based on Samuel's work in particular, that ATP binding was uh, definitely a step that occurred during the dwell. So motor, the motor is not actually translocating at this point. It's holding on to the DNA, but it's busy cycling nucleotides. So at least binding ATP in the earlier iterations of experiments followed by these four really rapid uh, 2.5 base pair translocation steps in the burst phase. Uh, we knew that there, this must require some level of coordination, and we proposed at this time that, in fact, these nucleotide binding events, as well as these hydrolysis events, were ordinal, and with the ATPase monomers would take turns releasing ATP, binding ATP, next one binds ATP. So everything is nice and ordinal, ordinal, one follows the other. So there's going to be a lot of communication in this motor to keep this thing on track. And similarly, we made the assumption in the initial analysis that also the hydrolysis and uh, phosphate release steps are ordinal, following a pattern around the ring and therefore being coupled to some translocation. I'm jumping ahead about five years and an incredible amount of work uh, by very talented postdocs and postdocs and graduate students in Bristol-Mondes lab. Jorge uh, Kistal uh, used some absolutely brilliantly designed experiments. And if you ever want to show a student what you mean by developing an experimental hypothesis before you actually do the experiment and collect data so that they're prepared for or they think about all alternatives, uh, this paper describes it absolutely beautifully. And what Kistal was able to do using what was really an incredibly robust methodology was determined not only that ATP binds during the dwell, but that five ATPs appeared to bind during the dwell. He also confirmed that ADP was released during the dwell as well, and that ADP release was interlaced with ATP binding. So a subunit would release ADP, bind ATP, and then its neighbor would release ADP and bind ATP, increasing the complexity and coordination of this system to, to really a phenomenal level. Because a fifth ATP subunit, or the fifth ATP subunit, binds, uh, we made the, the assumption, or what we thought was a safe assumption, that it was likely uh, hydrolyzed and likely playing some other role. And it happened to be wrong in the end, as I'll explain, uh, which I can say because it was my idea and I advocated for this interpretation, which was because the ATP bind, the ATP bound state is holding the DNA in its, in its grip. It's originally bound to the DNA. But you needed to put energy into the system to release that grip to start this translocating burst. And therefore, I made the, the recommendation that the special subunit, which is not a translocating subunit, but a coordinating subunit, has to hydrolyze in order to de disengage the DNA so the rest of the subunits can actually hydrolyze and start moving. What this ended up... <coughs> leaving us with was this rather complex mechanochemical cycle, uh, which is mind-boggling still to think about. And if you have uh, insomnia thinking about this thing night after night, and you give me a call, I'll let you know what you can do to get rid of it. Cannabinoids help. Uh, but we ended up with this exceptionally complex mechanochemical cycle where we start with the, with the motor fully saturated with ATP, with our special subunit in this iteration, labeled with this S. 
which we assumed was the one possibly single DNA binding subunit in this iteration, and that it would hydrolyze and release this, allowing the subsequent hydrolysis event to actually start moving DNA, packaging 2.5 base pairs, and that this contact between a flat pentameric ring and the helical spiral of DNA would result in this translocation until you've exhausted your ATP. And then you go through this cycling process during the dwell where ordinarily and interlaced, you release ADPs, you bind ATPs, next one goes, and you can transition to an apo state. What this argued, uh, first and foremost, is that the amount of coordination and communication in this motor is extreme. Basically, every subunit within this transfer knows what the other four what, what the other four subunits are doing, as well as interacting with the DNA substrate, as well as trying to manage his own affairs by binding, hydrolyzing, and cycling uh, ATP. So it became, although much more complex than had been described in other model systems, uh, it, it was really intriguing because not only were we possibly looking at something like mechanical force generation, but the type of communication and control that ultimately when you see in biological, when you see in, in mechanical microscopic systems are essential. Nobody builds a car without an accelerator or a brake, right? Control of a motor is the next level of complexity and I would say beauty uh, that you see in these motors beyond just the elemental function, in this case, DNA translocation. Uh, we needed structure. Uh, to understand this thing, because it's obviously getting completely out of hand. Uh, the, one of the earlier structural breakthroughs out of Mark Moray's group was the solution of the, uh, the N-terminal domain, which is the ATPase core domain of uh, the 529-GP16 ATPase. It looked like almost any other ATPase. It had a Walker-A binding site. It had a Walker-B catalytic complex. It even had uh, what had been observed in other ring ATPase systems, uh, uh, an arginine that appeared to be positioned to act on the trans function when pushed up against the active site of the neighbor, which you can see here when we're actually looking at this thing docked into some relatively low resolution cryo-EM density of the motor. So this was our first real, real major step in, in actually putting some physical parameters, some physical, uh, a physical framework around what had been, at this point, just a theoretical mechanochemical pathway which was not at all anchored in structure. I actually think of that as an advantage because if we had done it in the opposite direction and we had solved high resolution structures first, we would have been forever blinded by anything else because, oh, it all had to relate to whatever structure it is that we're looking at. Whereas developing the mechanical chemistry in the absence of structural constraints, there's, there's a curing to that in that you're not trying to force it to fit into other observations. You're actually just letting it speak for itself. Uh, we've tried to do similar things with the structural work as well, and then re-merge them in a way in which we can holistically understand and describe these things. Uh, those of you working in double-stranded DNA phase UTP ages or, or terminases know that they are a complete pain in the ass, they poorly behave, they precipitate, they don't like to crystallize, yada, 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 yada. So Mark uh, went for an alternative. Uh, we have a phase called ASCC 528. Coincidence? I think not. Uh, very similar to 529, it does not code for this pRNA scaffold molecule, although we've looked desperately for it for a number of years. Uh, so we're really not sure how this thing really attaches to the prohead, at least not yet, although I think we're pretty close to probably getting some understanding of that. But it was selected because of the sequence similarity uh, of, uh, of its ATPAs and the 529 ATPAs, but also the predicted solubility of this, uh, this uh, ring ATPAs in solution, hopefully making it an, an acceptable target for crystallization. And crystallize it did. And not only did it crystallize, it crystallized as an oligomer. It was the first oligomeric structure of packaging and ATPAs reported. Uh, it actually is two pentamers that are like two hands standing on each other's fingers, uh, which is hopefully artifactual, because I have no idea how you would then make this thing work, how it would attach to a probe in the DNA. Uh, so we usually think of it as this is somewhat of an artifact of either cloned over expression or the crystallization process itself. And when we, when we tried to interpret this structure, we really only looked at a, a single pentamer. It's also somewhat, uh, it's not completely, uh, it, it's not completely symmetrical. There's a little deformation, which is also a promising sign, meaning 
maybe something in the structure will actually show us some sort of movement that might be coupled either to the catalytic events of ATP hydrolysis or the force generating events that we were so desperate to describe. Uh, like uh, all uh, ring ATPases, it also has two domains. It has the internal ATPase domain here with ATP, uh, ATP docked into it, and here what are the transacting residues on the other side. Uh, the C terminal domain, which is also, was also solved in parallel by, uh, with an MR by uh, um, Mark Steen, uh, looks like a vestigial nuclease. It looks like a nuclease, and it's only missing the catalytic residues. Uh, so even though you might not like 529 because you don't cut DNA, we retained the core function of a nuclease domain, arguing that we need it in order to translocate DNA, and therefore the nuclease domain and the other double stranded DNA phages also likely plays a direct role in translocation, as well as the restriction uh, process that, that's experienced during DNA maturation and helpful packaging. It also has this really long linker arm. And this is a really cool object because of what it actually leads us to. Uh, that linker arm, and here was one monomer highlighted uh, in the ribbon diagram, reaches over and basically wraps its arm around its neighbor. There's a, a extensive surface area contact between subunits through this, through this linker arm. Uh, and it seems to also play, a, play somewhat of a role based on its position relative to the ATP binding site in regulating nucleotide binding. That's what gets you in a second or so. But having, having been able to solve this in the oligomeric form, it let us see what the contact interfaces are between the ATPAs and what we found uh, adjacent to the ATP binding here, once we modeled it in, and the catalytic residues that you see in the standard Walker, Walker B is we have several residues reaching over from the adjacent subunit, and they actually stick out underneath this connecting arm here. And they fondle DNA in some way, one way or another. Uh, we've since identified these two uh, uh, without going into the detail. One seems to be playing a role, uh, a key catalytic role in Phi 28. It's K133. It's a, it's a different lysine in Phi 29, which seems to be a transacting residue that interacts with the catalytic complex and possibly is the trigger for ATP hydrolysis, at least that's our current uh, belief, which means that this becomes part of the coordinating mechanism between this complex pentameric ring where everybody knows what everybody's doing. And the reason why they know is because they're the ones actually triggering hydrolysis. The neighbor is also the one triggering release of the nucleotide after hydrolysis. And we've shown in 529, there's a transacting argument in 146 which in some of the molecule studies by Sarah Tafoya that I won't describe in detail, show that this arginine actually acts as a release factor. So not only does your neighbor help you hydrolyze, it also helps you get rid of your ABP after hydrolysis during this nucleotide cycling as well. But honestly, I was overwhelmed. Uh, I've never been good with structure. Uh, again, I did fail by chemistry the first time I did. Um, but, uh, Mark and I were both like, okay, what do we do? We have all of this, we have all of this structural information from this, from this crystal structure. This kid from Duke, Josh Pajak, gave us a cold call and he's like, hey, uh, I'm doing molecular dynamic stimulations of packaging ATPAs. Do you mind if I work on yours? And we were like, hell yeah. So uh, Anton is this large purpose cell uh, molecular dynamic stimulation device, which is the largest, highest capacity stimulation. Uh, platform it's actually in its third iteration now, which doesn't just give you simulation capacity, which you can do on your laptop if you want. It's the time scale that the, the large, the massive computing power, the parallelized computing power of the Anton system gives that gets you away from just little quibbly things like a, a side chain wobbling to actual domain shifting or rearranging as you're, as you're putting it through some sort of stress, such as uh, binding a substrate or whatever. And as an example here, if we look at the apo state of a monomer cut out of the whole molecule, we did stimulate the whole ring, including the DNA bound. Then the apo state, this is the connecting arm of this guy's neighbor. It's holding its arm out and not doing too much. But if you put ATP into this thing and stimulate it, this connecting arm reaches over and closes down. 
and we invariably switch terminology between uh, uh, linker or connecting arm or connecting linker and lib domain, which is analogous to the lib domain thing seen in the broader class of ring GPAs, which is often identified as an object that helps stabilize the binding of uh, nucleotide and in some cases facilitating or triggering hydrolysis. So that argues that the neighbor to not just these catalyst not just this catalytic transacting lysine or this ADP ejecting uh, arginine uh, are mechanically coupled to each other with this closure of this this lid domain over the adjacent neighbor. Uh, when the lid domain actually closes over its neighbor, it wants to push it down. So at the same time, it was a very busy time. Uh, we went old school. We went back to this very same particle that I had generated almost 25 years ago. So basically, my career has been 25 years of trying to get better and better preparations of a single particle. It's a little insane, whatever. Uh, we got it to high resolution, exceptionally high resolution. Uh, this is a structure generated by Mike Whitson at, at uh, UTMB. He's still there, Mark, and I knew Mike, Mike is still there, and he's here, in fact. Uh, generated this exceptionally high resolution structure of this filled head with the motor still intact and, and positioned on, on the uh, packaging vertex. You can see the quality of the, uh, of the map, including you know, a very good demonstration of the HK97 core fold in the capsid. Mike actually has a poster on the capsid structure. He, write, he also reconstructed anti particles to high resolution, so I encourage you to take a look at that. Uh, but you can see the components of the ATP. This is the RNA, and you can see these beautiful RNA helices where we put stru crystallized structure of RNA into the cryo density. So, what does the ATP look like? Uh, it's a bit of a mess. So first and foremost, if you look at the DNA, and here we've just started doing a relatively crude model of DNA into the density itself, the DNA is highly distorted. It both tint and is and is sort of unwound a bit as it transits through the, the pentameric ring ATP is uh, the top of the of the ring of the of the pentameric ring, which is the C terminal domain, this vestigial nuclease binding domain of 529 ATPase, sounds just a relatively plainer ring. It's not very exciting. However, the ATPase domain, the N terminal domain, is not at all a flat five-fold symmetric object. It's a highly distorted pentameric. And if we simply focus on its structure itself, what we can see is that we can see these large connecting arms reaching from one subunit across the neighbor. And it actually forms this, this open ring, this lock washer structure, or this helical structure, where five contiguous subunits gradually increase across the plane and then are still connected to the far side of the open ring. By, a, by another connecting arm, which is distorted to the, to the extreme and able to keep this a closed pentameric ring. Uh, looking inside the channel, we could see what we want, what we, what we were very happy to see. Things like certain charge residues actually following the registry of the phosphate backbone of DNA. One in particular, K56, actually tracks the phosphate backbone almost perfectly, the exception being the top subunit is about a base pair off. There's an explanation for that, but I don't have time to get into that right now. But also, as a, as a warning for those of you who look at a structure like this and think, as we did and published, that, oh, A56 must be a key phosphate binding ATPase residue. Well, guess what? You change this fucker to an alanine, and it still packages DNA. So it looked great on paper, but it did. The, the, what did uh, Alex or Stephen, who did he quote? Uh, there's nothing like a brilliant hypothesis destroyed by an ugly little experiment. Uh, but we came up with this mechanism based on the fact that we had a planar ring of the 528 form, and we had now this distorted helical structure of the ATP is binding and hydrolysis in 529, and came up with this crazy idea that cycling between a helical form to a planar form and coupling that to ATP binding and ATP hydrolysis may in fact act like a physical ratchet to actually jack the DNA in as we continually cycle back and forth between this helical and planar form. 
by projecting onto that the mechanochemistry that we got out of the, out of the single molecule work, we describe this, of course, as an ordinal uh, operation, where a single subunit would release ATP, would hydrolyze ATP. We knew from biochemistry, as well as from, uh, from long ago, as well as simulation, that the ATP bound form is rigidly attached to the phosphate backbone. Once it hydrolyzes and releases phosphate, it lets go. So instead of an ATP hydrolysis event leading to that subunit pushing DNA, what it leads to is that subunit letting go of DNA. And since this thing wants to be in a planar ring, the other four subunits move up. And since those other four subunits are still attached to the DNA, the DNA moves up with it. And we translocate 2.5, 2.5 base pairs per ATP hydrolysis with it. We do that sequentially around a ring, and this then begin, becomes a tractable model for our birth event where we're translocating uh, twin base pairs of DNA coupled to five catalytic hydrolysis events. So the first hydrolysis event that I suggested was simply a, a get started for translocation hydrolysis earlier is in fact a translocation event itself. The last hydrolysis is the one now that is a little mysterious and we're not exactly sure if it's functional, but we do have some idea. And then when you're in an all ADD form in here in orange, you start to reset, and what's happening is, as you bind ATP, that increases your affinity for the phosphate backbone. So in your APO state, you're kind of wobbling around, and then ATP starts to come into your pocket, and you grab the DNA, and once the ATP type binds, you type bind to the phosphate backbone, and so the helical distortion of the ring that we saw in cryo from a gamma S ATP stabilized particle was in fact driven by the distortion that we see from ATP binding and the tensioning of these contacts in the this video. How much time do I have? Yeah. Um, All right. And this is what it looks like a movie form. <laughs> so it's, it's quite elegant and I'm, I'm quite fond of it. And I think it comes pretty close to agreeing with everything that we think is happening with this motor in that we get this distortion the distortioning of the, of, the, of the whole ring to form this helical structure, and then it's subsequently collapsed by uh, ordinal and sequential hydrolysis to drive DNA upward, in this case, in the direction of the prohead, which would be in the vault of this maze. Uh, it's not often that you get to do a validating experiment simultaneously, but we were doing a validating simul uh, experiment simultaneously at UC Berkeley, uh, where uh, uh, J.P. Uh, Castillo and uh, Alex Tong we're actually trying to see if not only can the motor package DNA, can it package double-stranded RNA? What they found is that it in fact can, although it struggles, and with hybrid molecules it struggles as well, because there's a little bit of a registry change, because the pitch and position of the phosphate back on double-stranded RNA is somewhat different than DNA. But it does translocate, but the bursting behavior is very strange. So on double-stranded DNA, if you look at the subsets, the 425 case pair subsets, they're of equal size for each burst event. With double-stranded RNA, rather than being a subset of 2.5 base pairs of RNA, it's the same physical dif distance as translocated 2.5 base pairs of RNA, because RNA, double-stranded RNA, is a little squashed compared to double-stranded DNA. It'll do three subsets, and then it only has to go 0.15 nanometers to finish the last one. This argues that the mechanical stepping of the motor is not inherent to the periodicity of the substrate, but inherent to the conformational changes that exist or are driven simply within the ATPA's ring itself. And just so you think that we're not so brilliant in coming up with this, this mechanism was proposed by Jan Schemla back in 2009, uh, and without any evidence that there was any helical form of the motor, he sort of cast it aside, uh, but it's a pretty beautiful prediction that, that, in fact, he guessed this based on the asymmetric translocation. All right. I just want to get the one. There's a lot of other things that we're looking at uh, because this, mo this model is not completely complete. First of all, the motor slows down not because the speed with which the DNA is driven into the head, is changing, but, th but this non-translocating dwell period is extending. It's getting slower and slower and slower. This means there's some sort of a feedback regulatory mechanism in the motor 
to tell it to slow down. And it slows it down, in fact, by changing the fundamental kinetics. You see a drop in the VMAX, dependent on the level of head going that we see. And we also see this shift in the VMAX over, KM, over KM ratio, which tells you that there's something fundamental in the, in the biochemistry of ATP binding and hydrolysis that is regulated in response to DNA being packaged into the head. Something has to connect those two events, and we're looking for what those things are. And now we get a little crazy with one last thing, which is it's a great model, but there's a few things I don't like. Like, for instance, if we go from our helical form, which is tracking the phosphate background, here these are two base pair increments, going from here to here during the translocating burst, what we missed, and what Bustamante also missed in his paper, is rather than using 2.5 base pair substeps, these are only two base pair substeps. And there's only four of them. So the DNA should only be going in eight base pairs if this model is correct. And similarly, during the reset, it only reaches down eight base pairs from where it started. So where the hell is 10 base pairs coming from? My insane idea is that there's a particle that we haven't seen yet. And that rather than simply going from a, a, a helical to a planar form, that the motor actually transitions from a steep helical form, an ATP bound form, to a shallow inverted helix in the other form. Because what this allows then is not just a translocation of two base pairs, but of 2.5 base pairs with each hydrolysis event. It also gets us out of the problem of how does this thing reset? Because it now positions the first W is going to cycle its, its ADP and rebind the DNA. It's now perfectly positioned to reach down and grab 10 base pairs down from the origin point of the burst it was just associated with. And this closes one of the one of the conceptual loops in the model that, that we weren't very happy with. Uh, fantastic collaborators, graduate students, and postdocs all. Absolutely the best. If anything, I just sort of knit things together from the effort of people who are much more brilliant than I are working with I am. And last but not least, uh, I lost my partner, uh, Shelly Grimes, five years ago to an aggressive cancer. Uh, Every time something new happens, Marie and I wish Shelly was here to see it. But, of course, that's a futile wish because Shelly already knows. Thanks for your time, and I'll take a few questions if you have any. Thank you. I'm going to lost track of time. I always naively think of the ATPAs as a, almost like a rotary aircraft engine. Mm -hmm. I mean, are you sequentially firing an ATP? I mean, you have to do that. You have to You're sequentially firing an ATP, but unlike a rotary engine in which basically it has two fivefold symmetry. You fire one, but then the motor resets, and you just basically, it's like you're rotating the motor 72 degrees. This is a completely asymmetric object. There's no such thing as, as recapitulating the confirmation just by rotating at 72 degrees. It, it's wholly asymmetric. So it would be like a rotary engine that they all prime with gas, and then they all ignite and fire instead of completing that cycle individually before moving on to the next one. Um, um, there are loads of questions, but um, what should we do? It's getting late, huh? I, mean, I, have to I have no idea what time it is. I'm like barely conscious right now. It's, <laughs> it's 10 to 9. One, one more, Roman. One more. Well, I haven't seen Roman in a while. Let him take a shot out. Nice talk, and uh, a great mechanism, actually, if you want to sort of similar lock washes that I've seen for Ro and other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's so. Uh, and I didn't talk about other systems. Clamp loader also has a helix so, variant. Um, one of the, the big questions in this field is still what modulates the affinity for the nucleic acid for the substrate. How does that propagate structurally within the model? Uh, that is a, a challenging question because uh, I keep saying that when God invented this motor, arginines and lysines were on sale. There are so many arginines and lysines in close proximity to the phosphate backbone and the lumen of this ring 
it's going to be a very challenging task to actually do the needed genesis to start to identify ones that are critical to function. As well as the charge residues that encircle the ATP's active site. There are like eight arginines within striking distance of the phosphate of the uh, of the triphosphate. Uh, it's, it's, we're, we, we actually right now, hopefully my staff this week will complete our first set of uh, allium scanning mutants to the charge residues in the lumen. Anything goes at this point. What is, what is clear is that whatever is the contacting residue with the, with the prostate backbone has to be mechanically coupled to the ATP binding site because ATP binding is what drives the affinity of that interaction between the charge residues in the channel and also it's rele the release of those residues upon hydrolysis. But that's, that's the future. Thank you, sir, for going so Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And now we we'll welcome Steffi Babitz from Berlin. Um, Is your mic? I hope it works. Yeah, it works. Great. Thanks a lot, Andrew. And I think I get a pointer as well. Okay. Good. Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you to Cecile and uh, and Fred to uh, giving me the opportunity to present a little bit of our work, uh, yeah, also from a couple of years that we are working on, yeah, on a stage entry into the cell cells or um, more uh, exactly on uh, systems uh, which, 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 which this, they, uh, we want to simulate uh, this situation. And actually, when a stage encounters uh, a bacterial cell, it's a bit like the situation uh, like in the um, old tale of Alibaba, who uh, encounters this, uh, um, this cave full of treasures, and he has actually to find the right uh, um, 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 spell to open, uh, um, to open that cave and, and get access to the treasures, which is Ittaya Sim Sim, which means open sesame. Now this doesn't work. Maybe I should also find the right spell here. Yeah? And did you plug in the? Ah, he didn't. Okay. So uh, I wait. So anyway, um, great. Thanks. Um, so uh, bacterial phages definitely have to cross bacterial uh, um, envelopes in order to get inside and and do the next steps of their life cycles. And this is what my group is interested in. And I allowed myself to uh, take a really nice uh, um, recent picture from Pavel Plef Plefka's lab, who impressively uh, illustrates here with a, a cryo IT image of uh, what can happen on a, uh, during a bacterial phage um, infection and entry on a, a cellular envelope. And this is the uh, um, phage SD10, a nice free free geometry uh, um, asymmetry um, E. coli phage. And this is all these uh, particles here, and, and uh, they have colored this image according to the different particle states. So we have um, the empty particles in cyan, so they have already ejected their DNA. We have half ejected particles in blue. We have intracellular progeny in red. Um, and we have also the full particles around, and which is also nice, and we'll come to that uh, later, is that we also see uh, extracellular vesicles here, and they also interact with uh, phage particles. So I think there are certain paradigms uh, that we need to keep in mind when the phage uh, wants to cross uh, a cellular border, and that is, um, first of all, uh, if its genome uh, uh, has, to, uh, um, yeah, um, has to function uh, in uh, any relationship with the bacterial cell, it has to be transported into the uh, intracellular space. And what is the packaging that the phage uh, um, um, has to, to protect the genome prior to infection from any environmental uh, influences that remains outside? And this is also, I think, the main difference to eukaryotic viruses that get, get engulfed by cells when uh, infection starts. 
and even more, when uh, uh, the genome crosses uh, the, uh, the cellular border, uh, the envelopes are not demolished, but they uh, are just crossed and kept intact because the host, uh, of course, could stay alive for further functions of the page. And sorry, last but not least, this, as we all know, is a highly specific process, and we have a very different receptors on the cellular surface to mediate host specificity and mediate ecology of all kinds of stage populations. Um, and again, I took a nice picture now from Gino's lab. Where is he? I don't. I saw him at dinner. Ah, nice. Um, and they had this really nice uh, um, uh, structure of the T7 a DNA ejectosome, and this is actually what is happening when the page then has attached to the um, to the outer membrane. In this case, again of E. coli, because uh, um, to cross an envelope, of course, you need a tunnel structure. Then, and I really enjoy traveling to uh, UK today via the Euro Tunnel, and. Uh, it's great, you are uh, 75 meters beneath the channel, you have internet and everything. It's really great. So, and uh, the page also builds a nice channel here, and I think we'll hear more, hear more from, from uh, uh, these ejected zones from your talk and from uh, on posters uh, of people from your group who will also be at the conference. So I think we can uh, distinguish during this process two, uh, yeah, two kinds of events. So first of all, we have the attachment of the particle on the outside and uh, somehow the initiation of the infection. So uh, pages have to bind their receptors and they have to obtain a trigger that will then open the particle eventually um, to, uh, um, yeah, to uh, inject proteins and also, of course, uh, uh, DNA in, in, in case of DNA. And then we have the second uh, part, which is the genome delivery, the transport via the envelope, as shown here with this injectable. So we have to build up structures, or the page has to build up structures for genome transport, and uh, it will use tail parts and ejection proteins, so also the SD10 page on the slide before they use uh, uh, tail proteins to build uh, nozzles to uh, inject DNA inside uh, the E. coli cells. So, uh, sorry. Um, during the conference, I think we will learn much more about these processes in the sessions on Tuesday, seven, uh, session seven and eight. And I think you should also pay special attention to all these nice posters that deal uh, with these processes. Um, my group uh, rather focuses on the first part, which is really happening at the very beginning at the outside. Uh, it's about detection. It's about encountering a very complex uh, environment on a, a bacterial cell. And um, as you might know, I'm a glycobiochemist, so I'm also very much interested in, the, in glycans, and especially the gram-negative envelope with all its surroundings is very rich in, in glycans. And so uh, initial page contacts are with glycans, and um, I will quickly walk you through that to the gram-negative outer shell. So we are working with the gram-negative systems, and the gram-positive systems are also really um, intriguing and interesting, but today we'll focus on, on this uh, uh, dye uh, bacteria. So we have a biofilm uh, 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 layer in most of the bacteria that occur in nature, so we don't have these biofilms so often in the lab, but in, in many bacteria, bacteria outside we find these biofilm matrices. So uh, um, we have uh, polysaccharides that are um, building up these biofilms, and of course, we also have also capsules. And from the perspective of a phage, this is a barrier. This is a very strong diffusion barrier. And then on the next level, if we go further towards the membrane, we have a glycolipid layer. And this is in gram negative. This is a, 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 on the hetero bilayer of the outer membrane. So everything else here is already skipped. So we're really now uh, looking at the outer membrane. Um, it is a hetero bilayer, and there's a lipopolysaccharide or LPS. And uh, that might also, um, together with other structures, serve as a phase receptor here. And of course, the outer membrane uh, might also occur outside the cell itself in form of outer membrane vesicles. And uh, from a perspective of the phase, that is a strong phase population regulator. Um, I should mention at this point that polysaccharides have very interesting biophysical properties. 
they put um, be very closely related to the fun their function in uh, this uh, outer envelope. And uh, mainly, for example, if you look into biofilms and capsules, if you look more closely into the glycine composition, you find uh, very often find negatively charged monosaccharides. And these uh, negative charges who serve in uh, a strong water binding. So if you have a lot of water, you get these really um, viscous, um, slimy um, substances, which uh, is, um, is, uh, makes it then very much conceivable that the state would uh, have difficulties to diffuse. And if you look at that uh, more closely in the uh, typical uh, biophysical terms, we would speak about an entanglement of the polysaccharide chains that are in these layers, so they would then induce viscosity and be the stage diffusion barrier. And of course, if you want to study this, uh, um, these are very complex systems. I'm a chemist, I love reductionist models, and then I love to speak to people who deal with complex microbiology. So, uh, of course, what we would be interested in is just to break down this complex envelope system into some models. And what I would show you today also is how we uh, made giant unilamellar vesicles that closely resemble these uh, lipopolistic red upper membranes. So, uh, just uh, on the menu today, uh, first some biofilms, outer, sorry, outer membrane vesicles, and then the giant unilamellar vesicles as a model system. And at this point, I would like to acknowledge the people in my lab who have done all this work. So Mareike started at, in her master's thesis and worked with outer membrane vesicles and later on in her PhD with the giant unilamellar vesicles. Nina Brücker, who really regrets not to be here today. I think many of you know her because she has been uh, um, a very, uh, um, um, has been very often to this conference as well. She uh, worked on all the ejection systems and Tobias and Valentin uh, worked on the biofilm and on the diffusion uh, systems in there. Um, so let's start with the biofilms. So again, exopolysaccharides, I think we should really have a more chemical look onto them. Uh, and when we look into a biofilm, what is uh, the, the chemical compounds that uh, make these systems so viscous? So you see here uh, as a model of a biofilm, a, a cartoon, and you see what, that it actually contains a lot of substances. And of course, this is also species specific, so there are some variations, of course, and, and uh, bacteria adapt to different habitats and, and environments and make different biofilms. But what you can find is um, you can find proteins, you can find uh, cross linkable polymers, and they would also entangle when uh, it comes to certain concentrations. You uh, find uh, extracellular DNA and um, cross linking proteins, and um, cross linkable polymers, entangled polymers, and these electrostatically interacting polymers. These are main components that, con uh, that bring viscosity to the system. And if you look at uh, something that is viscous, you can use classical rheological descriptions of these uh, components. So, um, yeah, we find them in biofilms, also in capsules, also in part in an O-antigen layer, layer, and uh, they would, of course, uh, serve as a mechanical stress response, protect the embedded bacteria, and uh, would then, if you um, 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 look at the viscosity more closely, would then confer the viscosity or microviscosity uh, to the system, and this is dependent on the degree of entanglement of the system. And you can measure that here, and this is what um, um, Valentin and uh, Tobias have done in my lab. They have varied uh, the concentration of a model polymer, a glycan-based polymer, so this is a pure polysaccharide. They increased the concentration, and then they did viscosity measurements, and uh, you can either do macroviscosity, which you might know, you just take a viscosity meter, you throw a, um, a thing, a ball, into the viscosity meter and just um, measure the time that it takes to travel through this viscosity meter, and then you uh, can calculate diffusion, uh, um, uh, the, the diffusion times um, or the viscosity parameters. And what you find is interestingly is that viscosity, depending on concentration, would follow two regimes. And this is just uh, a different probes of different size. So fluorescent beads, 200 nanometer, 60 nanometer, a very small Alexa dye. And um, we have measured this with fluorescent correlation spectroscopy. I'll show you in a minute how this exactly works. But what you can see at this point is that at low polymer concentrations, 
uh, you get one viscosity regime, and when the concentration goes over a certain limit, then you get in the second regime with a different slope. And um, this uh, point here, where these two regimes cross, would be the critical entanglement concentration, which would be a typical parameter of your biofilm, for example. So this is um, 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 a way to, to quantify biofilm parameters very specifically and, and species specific. Um, and I uh, now uh, introduce you to the model system uh, with which we, we looked at that. So this is a bacteria from the Avenia species. So this is Avenia amylovora. We've grown that in the lab. It's a plant pathogen. You might know that because it uh, um, causes the fire blight in apple trees. Um, so the exopolysaccharides, so you see the bacteria in the middle, you see the exopolysaccharides uh, surrounding the bacterium. And uh, so this, uh, if this is um, occurring in a plant, it will eventually clog the xylem and the plant will uh, yield because uh, they cannot transport liquids anymore. And then these apple trees um, affected by this pathogen would get these uh, uh, wilted leaves. And uh, with climate change and uh, increasing temperature, this really becomes an issue for uh, commercially uh, um, grown apples in Europe. So uh, it's also an interesting system for that. Um, we chose uh, these systems to, to produce a biofilm that is exclusively or mainly made from polysaccharides. So if you look into E. coli, for example, E. coli would also make protein curli. This is a bit of a different story, also very interesting, interesting, but we thought we should rather concentrate on one uh, or on one major compound, which is the glycan. So we can produce it in the lab. We grow the bacteria on an agar plate. You just put a filter disk, and then you can scrap off the biofilm. And we know the structure of this, uh, in this case, of this amylovoran. So it's a long polymer with short side chain branches. And for those who are not so familiar with the CFG notation of monosaccharide building blocks, this is the glucuronic acid that uh, provides the negative charge, which then would uh, mediate water problems. And Tobias has also um, uh, um, done um, a molecular modeling of the a coarse grain modeling of these polymers, and you see you nicely see this in tandem and uh, in um, um, in relation to concentration. So, and of course, what we were interested in was of course putting the phages in these systems, and this is a simple single particle tracking of P22 phage that is our pet in the lab very common. You just put it uh, through it in the in the uh, in the uh, um, biofilm matrix, and then me then measured how these uh, uh, particles would move. It, I don't know how well it is visible, but you see these traces. Eventually, where the arrows are, you see some uh, phages that get blocked. So the phage can travel through the matrix at a certain pace uh, with a certain um, diffusion um, um, speed. And uh, so, uh, of course, uh, this diffusion is, of course, much more, uh, it's, it's more, uh, it's slower than uh, in buffer, of course. So it's a, uh, a diffusion barrier. So uh, to quantify this diffusion inside a biofilm, we use the fluorescence correlation spectroscopy very briefly. So you take a fluorescent probe that you put in the focal volume, and then you have your matrix, and you measure the fluorescence fluctuation. So how often does your probe travel through the uh, confocal volume, you can autocorrelate uh, this and then from this autocorrelation function um, calculate uh, the diffusion parameters of the system, which is then a microviscosity um, um, system because you have looked at very small particles. And uh, then you can use these the diffusion times and uh, uh, use different uh, particles and see what happens. So when we increase the concentration of our biofilm matrix, and we have here compared phages with simply polystyrene beads fluorescently labeled, we can see that uh, uh, with uh, increasing sewer time concentration, we see that subdiffusion. Um, and that uh, and if we get the subdiffusion, uh, we can, in, in, um, in addition, probe if we just compare with the sucrose solution, which is a mono or a, a disaccharide that cannot entangle, that uh, where we should see a different diffusion behavior. So um, what we know is that it, uh, the, the microviscosity or subdiffusion depends on the particle size, on the surface structure, and then you can imagine that the pages can modulate this uh, in this respect to a biofilm. 
Um, and of course, this is tightly controlled. So, uh, bacterial phages can control it, for example, by, um, by depolymerases. And I'll show you in, in the next slide how this works. Also, bacteria can dissolve uh, biofilms by expressing certain enzymes to, to change uh, its structures. And of course, uh, biofilm matrices have maybe also uh, different ages and varying compositions that would all uh, contribute to phage composition. Um, and you can indeed see here we have um, isolated a uh, phase right from a phage specific for this plant pathogen, um, 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 for this plant pathogen that has a depolymerase that can destroy this matrix. And if we add this phase spike, um, we can see that the um, substitution that we see for for different uh, uh, particles of different sizes would then uh, go to normal. So uh, to the same diffusion parameters as in bucket. So in principle, a phage can uh, use the biofilm or can uh, travel in the biofilm and can control its uh, composition to, uh, to move there. And this is where we are at the moment to um, now uh, understand how free diffusion and sub-diffusion and free polymerases would uh, work together to uh, look at phage detection dynamics when the phages are infected in the biofilm. And uh, we can add these two polymerases, and we can also look at host uh, population dynamics in these slide in this biofilms. And it's very interesting because what we know from uh, theoretical models is that phage uh, diffusion and coexistence is uh, uh, the bacteria, bacterial population in biofilms is dependent on the um, phage uh, uh, diffusion dynamics. And we would like to uh, contribute experimental parameters to that. Okay, so uh, phages are traveling through biofilms. Let's uh, now uh, switch gears because they will arrive on the cell surface. And uh, they will eventually uh, meet their receptors there. And um, these receptors uh, might be glycans, and they are, of course, also under, under bacterial phage control. The glycans can be modified. Phages will do that to prevent super infection. Um, uh, that is uh, very often the lysogenic conversion that we um, observe when a receptor changes when a prophage is present or phage has infected a cell. But uh, it can also mediate co phage coexistence and on the same time bacteria control these structures on the surface um, by mutations if uh, the receptors are out of membrane proteins um, and they can also do uh, escape mutations in the glycan synthesis cluster so that these glycans disappear from surfaces. They can uh, vary O antigens by phase variation. So you again see a high level of complexity. And bacteria, of course, when they um, um, change their envelope, they usually use uh, vesiculation to rapidly remodel their envelopes. And um, I'm oh, sorry, yeah, you can also have phenotypes, which is loss of O antigens. And for this remodeling, they use outer membrane vesicles. And this is what I want to speak about next, because these outer membrane vesicles would also control phage. Um, so outer membrane vesicles, very briefly, are the extracellular vesicles, in this case of some negative bacteria. Uh, have varying compositions, uh, can be virulent, transmit meters, uh, can uh, transport uh, substances can exchange uh, cell wall uh, structures rapidly, as I already said, um, 50 to 250 nanometers. So they are approximately in the same size range as phage particles. You can see that here. So we have um, an, an outer membrane vesicle of uh, uh, salmonella, and we have two phages sitting here. And we can uh, assume that one phage is maybe even uh, has lost part of its DNA. There we have one that seems intact. So they serve for a lot of purpose purposes, and they very efficiently reduce bacterial phage activity. And uh, we can uh, just see that in a simply uh, simple plating assay. So we can uh, plate phages over about uh, um, uh, about four hours, and uh, we then mix the phages prior to plating with lipopolysaccharides. In this case, it's P22 O antigen specific phage, LPS is the receptor. Uh, so the phage very efficiently gets um, 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 inactivated, and then we have different uh, outer membrane vesicle prop, um, separations, and they're also inactivated phage very efficiently. Interestingly, we have 
um, uh, outermembrane vesicles that we may make by French press. This is what we usually do because we want uh, to get a larger concentration. But it's, of course, very interesting to compare them with those outermembrane vesicles that are bodied by the bacteria itself. And you can already see that they have quite different uh, inactivation properties. Uh, so for the beginning, just to learn about the system, we decided just to take uh, these uh, vesicles that we get when we just uh, uh, explode bacteria in the French press and, and collect the vesicles that form upon, upon French pressing. And again, what we see, LPS is a very efficient uh, um, stage in activated for such a stage like P22, Salmonella stage P22. And um, we can um, um, explain that by uh, the fact that the lipopolysaccharide, uh, uh, when interacting with the phage, would, uh, um, in, would provoke DNA release from the phage. And uh, many of you might know the uh, uh, experiments that we usually do in my lab, which is a fluorescent-based assay to monitor uh, uh, DNA ejection. I quickly go through that for those who might not be so familiar with that. So we take a very pure lipopolysaccharide, no protein present, it's a pure polysaccharide, um, and uh, we mix it in a fluorescence to that with the phage and with the dye, which is your pro one your, your dye, which is a dye that can intercalate with DNA, but only when it is in its relaxed uh, um, form in the buffer. So when you just in, um, debate a phage with your pro uh, in the pivet, then you only get a very slow stain. The DNA is uh, highly condensed in the capsid. Once it, it spills out, it will bind your pro, and then you get these nice kinetic traces. You can fix them to, to uh, uh, various kinetic models. And so you get this, uh, this black curve here on top. This is a typical ejection curve. And then you add DNA at the end of the experiment, and then the um, and the uh, uh, DNA signal uh, drops because the uh, single nucleotides as a DNA product won't intercalate with the dye. And what we can also do is add a case by protein. Case by proteins from these protoviruses uh, exclusively uh, bind the, the glycan part of the lipopolysaccharide, uh, the O antigen, so they would um, cleave away the receptor for the phage. And if we add this after one or two minutes, we can uh, uh, reduce the, the number of ejecting particles in the system. And uh, just again, um, the, the, the taste spikes uh, very efficiently reduce the number of O antigen repeats on a larger polysaccharide molecule. So, larger polysaccharides are nice because you can uh, um, um, analyze them on SDS gels, can stain them uh, with a silver stain. So, this is this uh, lane here. And uh, so each uh, band is um, an LPS molecule with a different uh, O antigen thing. And then eventually you can put stage or taste by protein, and then you see that all these long chains uh, uh, get reduced. And again, so just uh, uh, to confirm, typically these phages, now this is a myophage, but anyway, it's uh, the lipopolysaccharide together with the phage, you see that the phage now has an empty capsule. So this is the process we can look at. So go by going back to the vesicles, um, we did the same experiments because we wanted to know how do the vesicles uh, inactivate the phage. So very briefly, we have here the first curve, again, our normal LPS curve. And when we then, sorry, when we then um, into the, do the, we take the same amount of LPS, so we quantify the LPS inside the vesicles or incorporate in the vesicles. So this is the same amount of LPS present in either outer membrane vesicles or at free LPS. We get only 30% of the signal. Moreover, if we add DNA for the free LPS triggering the phage, we can access the DNA and can digest it down to about 30% of the signal. And we add DNA to this a preparation where we trigger DNA release with, uh, uh, with vesicles, we don't get uh, any uh, signal reduction. So the DNA is protected from the DNA. So what do we find? Uh, so the ejected DNA is, is protected, and we get much less signal. We get only 30%. And what we know is that 100% of our pages are associated with the vesicles. So what the question is now, do we have only 30% of fully ejected particles, like in this uh, image, or do we have particles that have ejected their DNA to only 30%? Both is possible. 
And this is in line with uh, what we observe in humans. So we either see these verticals and this uh, impact type, or we see verticals that uh, um, have um, lost their DNA, but of course it's in between we cannot quantify. So uh, to solve this problem, we went to a very old experiment uh, that has been invented uh, when um, um, the Ivilevich lab looked at phage lambda, and this is uh, using um, 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 uh, using um, uh, measuring the osmotic pressure and let the phage interact against osmotic pressure. So you can uh, take osmotic um, osmotic pressure, or you can uh, you can simulate the osmotic pressure in the system by adding um, a polyethylene glycol. So if you have a buffer, the phage would fully eject, eject, and when you increase the pet concentration, the phage would uh, eject against an increasing pressure, and eventually you uh, have a pet concentration that is so high that the phage cannot eject anymore, even if you mix it with the receptor. So this is this lovely work from the Ivelevich lab where they mix the lumpy protein receptor with phage lumpy. So we did the same with P22. We started very simple. We added uh, lipopolysaccharide, and then we increased the, um, um, the osmotic pressure. Again, you see that it's becoming a bit noisy when you measure fluorescence in that. But what we find is to get about 30% of DNA ejection from um, a P22, you need an osmotic pressure of about uh, 0.4 atmospheres, and for a complete block of ejection, about uh, 6 atmospheres. And, uh, what you also can probe is when you uh, do the ejection in the presence of PAG, you add DNAs, and then you um, uh, get a reduced access because most of the DNA with increasing PAG concentrations would simply remain in the cap. Okay, so, so this is fine, and we have about the parameters of the ejection of P22 in, into the free solution and into the buffer, and now we do the same with the vesicles. And what do we find? So, uh, again, it's getting even more noisy in the experiment, but what we find is that uh, um, for the um, for 20% pack, we still see ejection, and 20% would normally be the value for P22 in, in buffer, where it, uh, ejection would already be completely st stopped. So apparently, when we add vesicles, even in the presence of pack outside, the page can still inject into the vesicles, and um, so uh, the osmotic pressure to block uh, ejection is, is about six atmospheres. So this would be in favor of uh, particles still ejecting, whereas others uh, would be uh, still here. So uh, this is uh, uh, the, uh, uh, this is the, the um, um, where we are um, at the moment. So uh, outer membrane can inactivate phages, and we think there's two mechanisms going on uh, on parallel. On the one hand, uh, uh, the DNA uptake can be uh, an inactivated mechanism, and also the pure attachment, which would prevent these phages or, or, or trap these phages from the system. Okay, so uh, this is uh, vesicles that we got from bacteria or from intact membranes. We were also interested in more simplified systems and, and looking uh, more closely into this uh, membrane transfer process. And uh, therefore, we wanted to construct LTS um, uh, model membranes. And this is my last little bit of this talk. Um, uh, uh, and then we can all go to the bar and relax. But before we really have, I have to introduce you to a really complex molecule to which I have dedicated a lot of time in the lab, and that is lipopolysaccharide. And I don't know, not many people work with lipopolysaccharide, and I think they know why, because it's, uh, it's really uh, a mess. Um, it's, uh, you see here the structure of it, so this is one from E. coli. You see you have a lipid A part here, um, so uh, um, lipid chains linked to an acetyl glucosamine phosphor um, phosphorylated, so you get the negative charges. So often it's nice to have magnesium in your LTS preparations, and then you have a core oligosaccharide, and then you have all these uh, vari variations in O antigens. We already looked at the gels, nice page inactivated. Um, can be homo heteropolysaccharides, um, 4 to 40 repeat units, and this is what you call smooth LPS. This is when the, 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 that is what makes your cultures looking round and smooth on, on a culture plate when they have this 
Oh, antigen. If they don't have it, it's a rather um, poly dispersed the antigen uh, uh, distribution. So this is why you get this Gaussian distribution of chain lengths. And this is what makes really difficult to work with. It is when you purify it in the lab, it makes aggregates. And it doesn't make regular nice aggregates. You can see that maybe here. It makes these sausages. It makes anything. It has a, 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 a critical micro concentration below 10 micrograms per mil. Depending on what you put, to uh, bivalent cations, etc., it will change its structure. So it's uh, really not obvious to, to de describe it uh, uh, in a single and, and an ambiguous way. Um, and so last but not least, of course, uh, the, the, the lower part is that what we would call endotoxin and uh, that uh, would uh, um, provoke an innate immune response and eventually, eventually also sexist. Okay, so how to construct a model uh, system from, from, this, uh, from this molecule or from the hetero bilayer of the outer membrane of uh, gram negative bacteria? So, hetero bilayer, you have to like polysaccharide on the outside, and you have a phospholipid layer on the inside. Um, there's not much in the literature or some other lab, and uh, we decided to make giant lamellar vesicles. Giant lamellar vesicles are large vesicles that you can prepare in the lab. And now look at the scale. They are much larger than the outer membrane vesicles that you get in your bathroom from bacteria. So it's three orders of magnitude bigger. So you can imagine, uh, compared to the page, the page would be really tiny on its surface. But it is a nice membrane system, but it's very difficult to prepare. And Mareike, the, the PhD student in the lab, used a really nice uh, strategy. Um, so you, first of all, emulsify your, uh, um, you emulsify your LTS in oil, and that would mean that all your uh, hydrophobic parts would now be on the outside of these uh, inverted LTS micelles. And then you uh, put this oil layer onto a uh, mix that emulsify with water, and then you uh, centrifuge to get an interface, and then the, the LTS forms this interface, and unfortunately, again, it's not a very homogeneous thing. Um, something would rest, uh, stay in the water phase, there would be some gaps, and we take then some uh, phospholipids to fill the gaps, and then you have this interface. And then um, you uh, put your uh, phospholipids, um, that again, as droplets, that um, uh, as water in oil droplets, into your oil phase, and you can then centrifuge this through your interface and get these vessels. I think she worked one and a half or two years to get this. And she finally got these vesicles and she also purified them in the microfluidic device to get rid of all the RPS. And now this is really new and cool because she now added a virus and she added the Yopro dye, which we already know. And I think, I hope this works. Okay, you now see um, 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 a, a specific, uh, um, um, uh, an all antigen specific page. We can go again, sorry. Yeah, there it is, that uh, injects its DNA. So you see these green, so the LPS is uh, colored in, in uh, magenta, and the fade um, DNA will appear in green. So we can now see uh, in real time how the DNA appears here inside of this brown DNA lamellar vesicle. And uh, it took a page that is a little bit faster than the P22. The P22 is a rather, a rather slow ejector, so we took the 9 and and this is also a really nice project that Cecile and I now can work on together uh, structurally and from the mechanistic viewpoint. So we are very happy to continue here and also to now resolve this movie uh, with all. I mean, this is, I think, another PhD thesis to understand and analyze all this complex data, compare it to the different vesicle sizes and the DNA And um, what we also can do um, is uh, to, to use um, our uh, vesicles to prepare surfaces and then look at single page particles on these surfaces. Um, and this is what we're planning to make a surface on a glass slide and then look at single particles ejecting. This is a very preliminary experiment. Here we made it a simple way. We just uh, let P22 sit on a glass surface at the LPS receptor in a flow cell. And then you see how this is, the flow is going like this. And then the DNA comes out of the single particles here. Um, 
people who might be, um, uh, those of you ha who have been to this meeting uh, um, uh, since a couple of years might remember that uh, this is not our idea. It is uh, actually also a nice French uh, experiment from Lucien Littelier's lab, who has initially done this with T5 and then the 2A uh, protein research. Okay, so uh, let me wrap up. So uh, the gram-negative uh, glycan envelope is a phage host communication hub. Um, the lipopolysaccharide can trigger the DNA release and that even in the uh, absence of a full uh, membrane assembly. So, of course, they're still interested in working on that mechanism. Uh, I think with these setups, it would be possible. Um, the O-antigen is highly specific, but also mediates phage coexistence. I didn't talk about this too much today. Outer membrane vesicles. Um, um, have apparently different phage inactivation mechanisms, and they're of course also interested in, in what is then happening when these uh, paradigms are carrying phages. And last but not least, the phage is, uh, um, uh, sorry, the biofilms, the gly atom, uh, uh, outermost glycan layers around many bacteria are very uh, uh, dynamic and, uh, and complicated uh, phage based diffusion barriers that are worth looking at. Yeah, and with this, um, now this has, ah, this no longer works. I would like to again thank all the people who collaborated and did all the work. And I thank, sorry, and I thank you. Um, and I'm happy to maybe discuss over a more interesting things about the page entry, a cell entry. <laughs> thank you very much, Sophie. Are there any questions? Yes, there are. And uh, then, oh dear, <laughs> lots of questions. Hi. So, I have a, I, so my knowledge in things is not really good. <laughs> but uh, when you said 30% of the DNA is released really, in an extracellular vesicle, uh, is it, is it possible? Is it because your extracellular vesicle is actually smaller, right, compared to the phase? Uh, so if you have a multiple phase bound to the single uh, extracellular vesicle, maybe not all of the DNA can go into the vesicle. Yeah, that was also, also our idea, but so far the experiments we did would rather be in favor of a vesicle of, of a a phage that uh, eventually if it manages to get its DNA in, then uh, all then it's all in, right? Or we have other uh, phages that apparently get trapped, and of course we don't know. I mean, if the vesicle has already been filled with DNA, maybe a second phage. So we didn't have we have not yet done proper statistics on how many phages sit on a vesicle, how many are inject, uh, have ejected or not ejected, so I think there's still a lot of work to do. But two, the size might also play a role, as you say, because that would uh, uh, determine the membrane curvature. And uh, that is for sure also a parameter that is, has to be looked at. Um, in the case you say about five to six atmospheres were sufficient to completely suppress, but it's 20 atmospheres in lambda, 20, 25, it's 45 to 50 in SPP1, and I don't understand the difference. If you comment. So you don't understand the difference of the different uh, um, so, so the osmotic, uh, osmotic the pressures osmotic. in the different particles, or in yeah, the in, in the different particles, they both they all contain DNA at 500 meters per mole, round figures. Mm -hmm. Okay, but you got between you will make everything round figures. Mm -hmm. You are five atmospheres, SPP one at 50 atmospheres, mm -hmm. for the same amount of DNA. So, so I think what uh, uh, what the Evilevich lab proposed is that um, we rather see water diffusion inside the capsid, and uh, that indeed the capsid structure, and that would then explain why these different phages are different, 
would mediate uh, uh, water influx into the emptying capsule. I mean, that, that, I mean, that it wouldn't uh, con it wouldn't produce a vacuum when the when the DNA comes gets out. And then you have to organize water uh, going through the capsule uh, protein structures, which are different. Yeah, but we're not talking kinetics. We're talking equilibrium. Absolutely, but this so is an equilibrium. So what is not going anywhere? If you've got complete suppression of DNA ejection, you still retain 500 meters per mil DNA inside the capsule. SDP1 takes 50 atmospheres per glottal, you take 5. Mm -hmm. I just want to know mm -hmm. what is the difference? I, I don't know. I mean, also thermodynamically, it makes a difference to uh, to, uh, hy uh, to hydrate the DNA getting out, and we're, we're not getting out. We're completely suppressed. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So an osmotic pressure is a colligative property. It's counting molecules. So why are there tenfold more molecules, or what are those molecules in SPP1 relative to P22? Yeah, because but, yeah, but, yeah, but, 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 I don't know neither, but I think it's simply two different particles with two different um, um, characteristics of mediating uh, water influx and DNA influx. And uh, I think the biophysics behind it, you can discuss that over a beer. The biophysical right. principles are similar and the, uh, uh, the, uh, the chemistry is, is uh, different in, in, in two different protein systems of capsules. Maybe we can continue the discussion if we want to do. Um, any other thoughts, questions? If not, then okay. Um, great talk, Stephanie. Uh, I have a question about the. Uh, I mean, these kinds of things are very well known to me, right? Structure is solved and uh, mm. and some stimulus features like SF6 are quite well known as well. Uh, do you think that uh, the P22 tail spike is the, the only determinant uh, which allows the feed to find the host and which is uh, employed by the by the feed to find the liposomes you go to it? Thank you. Um. Well, we don't know better yet, I would say. So far, for our receptor system, it works well. If we mutate the tail spike, uh, we get uh, a, a slowed down ejection. We get not zero, and that's interesting. When we mutate in the P22 tail spike the, um, the depolymerase, then we still see ejection, but very, very slow. We don't see zero. We always argue when we publish that, oh, well, it's the... Uh, it's the enzymatic activity, it's gone, we see nothing. And then the referee said, well, it's nothing, but indeed it was a small cut. Very interesting. What, what is happening there? Um, I don't know. Um, we can make chimera, by the way, so we can make capsules fully filled and then tail them with, for example, an E. coli tail spike and then look at the ejection characteristics. Then you get the ejection kinetics of an E. coli RTS at high temperatures, I think. So, interestingly, you really see an RPS-specific process there rather than um, something that uh, depends on, on the capsid structure. We use the identical capsid, P22, equipped with E. coli tail spikes with two different kinetics. And, and it's, uh, we can uh, um, put the tail spikes to the capsid because we have the N-terminal head, P22 head binding domain. So, it's just the protruding... Um, specificity domain or antigen recognition domain that is different. So I would argue that the, the tail machine as such would be untouched and all of a sudden we see a different kinetic process when we use a different LPS. So it's, uh, um, it's also dependent on the, on the receptor. Thank you very much. I think we will close this uh, first evening session and thank you again and uh, Right, so I just, just got a couple of things uh, to say. I, so first thing, so I forgot to uh, tell our speakers that we actually recording all talks. And the idea is to put these talks up on the TVA website. Sorry. <laughs>
Yeah, anyway, if you have some issues with that uh, or IP, for example, or whatever, I mean, just let us know and we will not upload your book. Okay, other than that, the coffee between sessions tomorrow will be served in this area here, the same area where essentially you know, the extension of the area will be posters. And of course, there is a bar in the hotel, but we have our little bar here, so please do join us for things now. Okay? Thank you. Thank you.